Every week, a global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore pivotal challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Dr. Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guests, Drs. Naeem Alkuri and Rashmi Patil as they discuss these issues from their own unique perspectives on the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. For everyone with an interest in Nash, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, Surf's Up, Season 2, Episode 6 of Surfing the Nash Tsunami starts now. It's been quite a couple of weeks here at Surfing Nash. Uh, First, when we recorded our last episode, a week ago Friday, right after the FDA webcast, we told you we would drop that Friday night. But due to technical issues, we couldn't do so until Monday morning. However, when we finally loaded, the response has been nothing short of fantastic. At this moment, Buzzsprout says that eight days after we dropped this episode, it has the third most downloads of any episode we've done since the beginning of the podcast. And I don't mean third most after eight days. I mean third most total. And it took only eight days to get there. Podstatus.com, which is a service that we subscribe to, uh, reports that a a fatty liver podcast is one of the top 200 medical podcasts in six markets around the world, including Japan and France, and one of the top 20 in, of all places, Singapore and New Zealand. We've had over 2,100 page views and 1,000 downloads since we launched the pre-interview webcast interview last Friday. And... 1,500 is normally what we do in a month, not in 10 days. 2,100 page views in a month we've never done before. So these are huge numbers, tremendous listenership for an independent podcast in a disease that does not get the kind of PR that cancer gets, for example, or uh, certain neurologic conditions. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sticking with us. We promise it only gets better from here. We also promised that the music contest would end this week, and we would start with new music. For those of you who participated in the contest or listened, option B, which is Surf Funk, is the winning opener, while option A, the logo Surf Pack, is the closing sound. And thanks to those of you who voted. And with that, on to the podcast. In the aftermath of FDA's recent guidance through the white paper and last week's webcast, and in the context of some truly exciting trial results over the last several months, we are likely to see pressure for more trials, longer trials, and trials with larger patient enrollments. What I've observed in other disease classes throughout my career is that this creates pressure for sponsors and their investors to design trials with extremely aggressive sample sizes, enrollment criteria, and timelines. This kind of design can lead to disappointment over time as trials do not meet these highly aggressive goals and everybody has to scramble. So we thought this would be an excellent week to discuss current issues surrounding recruitment and conduct of fatty liver clinical trials and inject what Stephen describes as hashtag real talk into trial expectations. Fortunately for us, Stephen is a world-class opinion leader on these issues through his work in some clinical research. Also fortunate, our friend and frequent panelist, Dr. Naeem Alkhoury, is medical director at the Arizona Liver Health Institute, another leading clinical trial site for fatty liver studies, and he's with us today. Finally, we're fortunate to have with us Dr. Rashmi Patil of the South Texas Research Institute, another leading site in the conduct of fatty liver clinical trial design and execution. Rashmi, welcome aboard. We're glad to have you. Thanks for having me, Roger. Oh, it's, it's, it was great of you to be able to join us. So do me a favor. Look, just take a couple of minutes and tell people a little bit about yourself, the Institute, your background, and how you got to where you are right now. And one fact that nobody would know about you if you didn't tell them. Sure. My name is Rashmi Patil, and I'm a hepatologist and a clinical researcher. I am currently practicing in Edinburgh, Texas. It's a town located about 10 miles from the Texas-Mexico border. I am fellowship trained in liver transplantation, and I spent most of my career uh, treating patients with chronic liver disease. And very recently, after meeting Dr. Harrison in the past couple of years, moved my interest to NASH Research. South Texas Research Institute is a private clinical research site that I founded and I'm medical director of, and we're really focused on enrolling NASH clinical trials, mainly in phase two and phase three. And now we're also involved in cirrhosis-related trials. Let me add to that real quick, because I don't think gradually, this is a name you're going to hear more and more and more if you're listening to this podcast. Hopefully, it's a name you may already know. And if not, I, I welcome you to meet Dr. Patil, at a time when it's uh, able to in, in the current COVID era. But it reminds me a little bit of the, the the Super Bowl that happened last night, where you had Tom Brady against Patrick Mahomes. And, you know, you had the goat versus the kid. So Dr. Patil is Patrick Mahomes. 
She's coming onto the scene. She's going to rule this whole area in a matter of years. She is has all the potential in the world. And what she tells you today, I think, is really you know going to going to be straight from her clinical experience, and you'll find very very useful. So I'm thrilled you're on with us today, Rashmi. Thank you for joining. It's it's an honor to have you here today. Thanks for having me, and thanks for that analogy. <laughs> Stephen Rashmi was telling us before the podcast that she did watch the halftime show last night. I did. So. Somehow you got to work the weekend into this. I didn't know who this guy was the weekend. I, I learned. I had to text my children. I'm like, what, who's this guy? He was pretty good. Yeah, he was. So, so, so at the very least, still waiting for the one thing we wouldn't know if we didn't know it, if you didn't tell us. So I guess the one thing you wouldn't know about me is that I was a collegiate level tennis player. Until the age of 12, I was competing in national tennis tournaments and and had the aspirations of going professional. And at that point, really had to choose between putting all of my efforts into tennis or uh, my education. And I chose my education. And I still was able to go to Yale University on a, a Division One scholarship. So you wouldn't know that about me. And now we do. And I feel fortunate uh, on behalf of our listeners and patients that you chose to do that rather than make, try to make a career out of tennis. But that's, a, but that's a great accomplishment. Okay, with that all said, why don't we just kick off, okay? So opening question, we use the usual one, something that's happened in the last week, either personal or professional, good news that you want to share with us and with the audience. Brave one, go first. I guess I can go first. So, you know, many things are happening in the Nash diagnostic space, but I feel like we're working with several diagnostic companies now on validating their tests to identify these patients that will eventually qualify for pharmacologic treatment. So I've been involved in several discussions and uh, designing a couple of uh, studies at our Arizona Liver Health Institute to kind of uh, either, you know, get them to FDA level approval or even look at a uh, response to different lifestyle intervention. So I'm excited uh, for these uh, kind of investigator-initiated uh, studies. That's great, Naeem. Oh, I'll jump in next. I'm going to be rejoining the NHS for a, um, a short period of time, um, as well as Towers and Health. That will continue to get momentum. So I'm not stopping that. We're not stopping the negotiations and the scanning that we're doing and thing. But um, I'm going back to be a senior nurse to help deliver the vaccination program for an inner London City Trust based at the Excel Centre. We should have had easel last year. So trying to help out so that we can get this vaccination rolled out as quickly as possible and get the health service back up as quickly as possible. So just helping out colleagues again. That's great. Now, when we spoke about this a little bit last week on or off the podcast, you said that they had one station up and we're looking to get to 23. How's the progress on that going now? I don't know yet. I'll find out more when I um, do my induction and actually start. But um, that should be within the next uh, week or 10 days, I would hope. Congrats and, and uh, good luck with that. So I'll go with the professional accomplishment. The past year has been really difficult for most small businesses across the country. And I feel so fortunate that we at South Texas Research Institute have been able to grow steadily. We just hired our 13th employee um, and uh, a clinical research coordinator who's bringing over 10 years of experience. And so I feel really fortunate to be in a space at this time. That's exciting. exciting. So Stephen, that leaves you. Look, if you can't get motivated after listening to all the projects and goals and, and things that speakers on the podcast today are doing, you, you can't get motivated. So my professional win is just being associated with these guys because I can't keep up. You guys are awesome. We used to doing vaccinations. At, I know that building. I was Easel was there in 2014, I think. That place is huge for sure. I'll say just maybe not near as impactful is what you guys are doing. I'm, I'm excited about Nashtag this year. We've got a, a, an all-star lineup, cast of characters. The breadth and depth of discussion that we will have on Nash Therapeutics is unparalleled, and we will go hybrid. So it will be the first liver meeting where you will have a chance to be at in person if you so choose, but if you can't, you, you can connect virtually. And I, I'm excited about it just to see how it goes, but... Uh, Having been fully vaccinated, I'm, I'm ready to, to be there in person and see my colleagues and interact with them and, and see how we can, you know, continue to advance this field forward. So excited about NASHTAG. 
I'll have a rather trivial personal best, but before the podcast, you folks don't know, we were talking about weather. A San Antonio is heading into six days of sub-freezing or close to sub-freezing temperature. Rashmi was saying that down on the Texas-Mexican border where she is, it's likely to get into the 40s for a high. And if I were stuck in Corpus, I would have no clothing to manage this at all. However, I am back in Pennsylvania where I'm quarantining, but here, well, we got seven inches of snow yesterday and... 19, the day before I came back, at least I've got the clothing to handle it. And um, so I'm happy to be home. With that, uh, I, I'd like to break the next hour, the rest of the podcast really, into three sections. And uh, for each section, I'd like Rashmi, Naeem, Stephen, all to comment. And then Louise and I will ask questions or, or raise issues as we see appropriate. Idea being, as I said, that based on the momentum from the FDA webcast, I think it's a solid guess that people are going to become more ambitious in what they want to achieve in trials, in part because of that, and in part because of some of the excellent phase two results that we were talking about uh, last episode, the week ago Friday, that Naeem was highlighting some of the combination work he's doing and, you know, uh, obviously the FGF 21s. So anticipating people wanted to do more larger trials, that should create some issues that they might not anticipate, but you folks should be able to. The first thing I want to spend some time on is the practical challenges in recruiting patients. Manal talked a little bit about screen fail rates last week. We talk about that from time to time on the program, but how those are shaping up in some of the places where you lose patients and how an increasing complexity of trials, if you've got to get more non-invasive markers or whatever, in addition to doing uh, classic histology, will make, might make this even more complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a very important topic, Roger. So thank you for bringing this up. I'm going to start by talking about, you know, some of the misconceptions that I think pharmaceutical companies have when it comes to trials. And then I would like to hear from everyone else. So the first one is that, uh, you know, NAFLD is common and we have so many patients with NAFLD NASH that you can be selective in your trials and just pick, you know, the best patients. And I think this is uh, not true because, you know, the ideal NASH patient that everyone wants, they need first to have significant disease. So they need to have NASH with F2, F3 fibrosis. They need to have no significant alcohol consumption. They need to have a high BMI, but not too high of a BMI. They cannot lose, you know, more than 5 or 10% of their body weight in the previous six months of being in a trial. They uh, need to have uh, maybe a few medications, but they cannot be on several medications that will be exclusionary. And then uh, they cannot have many comorbidities outside of metabolic syndrome. So if they have, you know, sometimes rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, some of other chronic illnesses that we see frequently and so certain trials, they cannot be included. So, you know, the NASH patient that will qualify for trial is, is not a common patient that we see in our clinics. There are so many reasons to exclude them even before we get them to a screening for a clinical trial. So in my clinic, I'll tell you, I have a busy hepatology clinic and patients come to me for two reasons typically. Number one is elevated ALT or suspected NAFLD because of metabolic syndrome or because incidental finding of fatty liver on ultrasound or CAT scan. When I see them in clinic, I mean, I can tell you, we start by doing a fiber scan to estimate their liver stiffness and steatosis. And about 70% of people I see, they will not qualify for trials because their liver stiffness is too low. So you end up with fatty liver based on the CAP score. But when you look at the stiffness, it's at 4 or 3.5. And automatically, we're not going to look uh, you know, at this patient population for trials. And that's like 65, 70% of people I see. And then, you know, you have people that uh, consume too much alcohol. So whether it's, you know, 14 drinks per week for women, 21 for men. Uh, that's a common one. Medications, especially uh, specific ones like methotrexate, uh, tamoxifen. Uh, once you're on these, usually you do not qualify for any trials. And then you have people that you approach them about clinical trials and they just say, I'm not interested. And this is not a small percentage. I mean, many people just don't feel comfortable with the concept of trials. So to give you an estimate, I think we end up, you know, if patients coming to clinic uh, to see us for suspected fatty liver, only 5% go into screening for clinical trials. So this is the reality. You have to see 10,000 patients to get 500 to screen for trials in a year. So this is the biggest misconception I deal with uh, when we talk to pharmaceutical companies that you can be selective. And then sometimes you ask them, hey, well, this patient is on this medicine. And you say in protocol, uh, you don't want them to have any immunosuppression, suppressing medications. Is this medication okay? And they're so quick to say no. But I mean, they really don't look at, uh, you know, the degree of immunosuppression. Uh, are you really suppressing the 
entire immune system or just one cytokine. So, you know, I just feel like they need to have an open mind that it's not easy to find these NASH patients that qualify for trials. Naeem, that's a great start. So, Rashmi, why don't you take the baton and run with it? What happens next that the challenge that people wouldn't understand? I think that many of the challenges that we face are really at an education level, like physician to physician education. So, as Naeem mentioned, all of these patients that we're, we're talking about that are excluded from clinical trials because they don't have enough disease or they're on other concomitant medications that would exclude them. A lot of that education, we actually have to uh, do at a physician to physician level in the community. So targeting those patients that are highest risk. So if we took 10 patients with fatty liver, we really want to just look at those two or three that have diabetes that have been on stable meds for three to six months who you know don't have other major cardiac or other you know, extra hepatic diseases. And so I don't think that we spend enough time doing that. I'm a little bit different in that I am a hepatologist practicing in a standalone research institute. So I really can kind of tailor who comes through the doors, but I'm still very similar to Naeem. Even if I have a fiber scan day, there are still many patients that we see that have non-alcoholic fatty liver, but not enough stiffness on the fiber scan. The other patient level concerns that we see again and again are number one, that I feel well. I have fatty liver. You're telling me I have high risk findings, but otherwise I feel well, you know, so why should I be on a clinical trial? Number two, there's a lot of fear around liver biopsy at a patient level. And I would say number three, Three is that there's a general misconception, particularly in the community that I serve, which is 95% Hispanic, that being on a clinical trial is the uh, equivalent of, of basically being a guinea pig. So you have to do a lot of education, not only with the disease state, but also about what it means to be involved and enrolled in a clinical trial. Let me add to that from a slightly different angle. So, so we've talked about identifying a challenge in finding patients that would be willing to do a study and that would have at least a pre-screen criteria to do a trial. And Naeem mentioned that's roughly 5% of everybody he sees. And then there's the issue that Dr. Patil mentioned about educating the stigma in certain patient populations of a study or the perceived stigma and, and having to educate around that. Let me take it from a slightly different angle. If you look at where we were last year and the year before, and you go to clintrials.gov and you look up the number of trials that are currently registered to enroll patients, we're at a record number. The sheer volume of the patients required to fill those trials are beyond anything we've ever seen before. And there's a reason for that, right? So 2020, we had lots of incredibly positive data in early phase clinical trials. So now those 2A trials are progressing to 2B trials because there was positive momentum, positive data. And, and when positive data comes, then venture capital and people that invest in that field tend to get a little more excited about it. And so when these companies say, look, we need to go raise more capital to do a larger phase 2B paired liver biopsy study, it's easier for them to get that capital. And then when you marry that with the fact that the FDA is becoming a little bit more clear on the fact that the goalposts haven't moved, that digital slides are acceptable, and they're willing to work with you on histopathologic interpretation of the slides to try to minimize some of the inter-observer variability and some of the complexities of sampling and that sort of thing. There's a clear sense of momentum coming back in in 2021, at least in my opinion. So that's contributing to more studies. And the complexity of these studies is becoming more complex because if you think back to GenFit and Intercept, when they first launched their phase three trials, we didn't have MRI PDFF built into those trials. So now, when you look at trials that are in paired liver biopsy phase 2B or that are in phase 3 or that are headed into an adaptive 2B3 or quite frankly straight into a 3, we have three gates we have to go through. So just remember what Naeem and, 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 and Rashmi said. It's hard to find them. Then when you find them and you bring them in, you have to consent them. Then you get lab work. 
Then you send them for an MRI. Then you send them for a liver biopsy. And at every gate, they can screen fail. And so it's really important for sponsors to understand that we know there's a very finite screen fail rate around MRI PDFF. We can use CAP from FibroScan to predict what the screen fail rate will be if you set the PDFF cutoff at 8% or you set it at 10%. It's going to be roughly around 20% is your screen fail rate. We know that if you highly select people for liver biopsy, you know, you have a couple metabolic syndrome components. You pick a, an AST that's at a certain level. You pick a FibroScan KPA that's at a certain level. You use FAST. You use MAST. You use whatever you've got in your toolbox as a pre screen strategy to find the right patients to enroll in a study. Your best pathologic interpretation will screen fail slightly more than a third of those patients. That's the best case scenario. And, and so historically, what we've seen, whether it's Intercept, GenFit, the the kind of the landmark phase three trials that were done, or any of the ones that come after that, we're screen failing about a quarter of patients on consent or labs, 20% on MRI, and 30 to 40% on labs, giving you a cumulative screen fail rate of between 70 and 80%. So that's added on top of the fact that 80 to 95% of people aren't going to do a study or don't qualify for a study based on initial pre-screen criteria. So the funnel is getting very, it starts big, but it narrows down very quickly into what qualifies. That gets us to a discussion about how do we design trials, and we'll talk about that in a minute, to try to help mitigate some of those factors. So, Stephen, let me do a simple piece of math and see if I understand all this right. You have 10,000 patients. Naeem described the process by which that goes down to 500. Are you then saying that uh, two-thirds, three-quarters of those are going to screen fail out? Yes. So, fundamentally, for every 10,000 patients I've got, if I'm lucky, I might be able to get 100 of them, 150 of them, actually, to some kind of a trial. Yeah. I think that's accurate, Roger. You know, to randomization, I think that's what we get, about 150 out of the patients we see on a yearly basis. Okay. So, so, Stephen, a couple of months ago, in a slightly different context, you threw out the idea that there were 11,000 patients who were going to need histology, who were going to need biopsy to fulfill what was a clinical trial.gov, if I remember the number correctly. That's right. That's right. But let me tag on to something very important that Naeem just said. Even our biggest and best centers for NASH clinical trial enrollment get super excited if we can put 150 randomized patients into trials in a year. That's the biggest of the best, right? So you, you, you can multiply that number by the number of legitimate clinical trial sites that know what they're doing in NASH. And I don't say that lightly, and I hope people don't take offense at that. Enrolling a NASH clinical trial is not easy to do. You can't just throw a shingle out there and say, hey, I did a diabetic trial. I'm now ready to do a NASH study. Bring it on. It's incredibly hard to do a NASH trial. And it, it's interesting when I talk to CROs, which are the intermediary between a sponsor and a site, usually, they talk about all these sites. And, 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 and my first comment is, okay, well, we're going to build in a pre screen strategy using FibroScan and some lab tests to really super select patients. I think that's critical for any trial because it's not right to send everybody to liver biopsy. If we can identify with a high degree of negative predictive value, those that aren't going to qualify. And it, it's so it's very pragmatic that we set up some of these rules. And so then I hear the CRO say, well, we can't do that because a lot of sites don't have FibroScan. My initial reaction to that has now been backed up by data is if you don't have a FibroScan at a NASH clinical research trial institution, you don't do very many NASH clinical trials. And you're probably not the site that should be doing a trial for a sponsor. If I'm a sponsor and I have to go pick a set of sites to enroll my trial, obviously we all want the best. We want the guys that have been doing this day in and day out, that know the complexities of clinical trial enrollment, that know how to identify patients, that, that know how to help them understand their disease and get through a trial. Not just enroll in a trial. But remember, these trials are anywhere from 12 weeks to 18 months in duration, and keeping them on the trial and getting them to that second liver biopsy is critically important. And so that means every month we have to build that expectation. We call it in the military expectation management. You have to always let your patients know what's coming next, and particularly for another liver biopsy, that they don't get to the eight month, nine month, 12 month, and then drop out of the trial. So again, that's really, really important what Naeem said about even the best centers. This is the max number of patients that they can put in, and it falls off after that. So 
I want to come back to the best center idea, but I'm, I'm still a little bit stuck on the math because if you've got five, six million patients, and that's the total national population, and you can get, what did you say, 50 out of 10,000, that's a half a percent, and you could only a half a percent of those, if everything is managed well, will wind up being... Mass off a little bit, Roger. So, so Naeem's counting fatty liver patients. He's not okay. counting that patient because you know people that come in to see us are not already pre-identified as highly selective for at-risk NASH. These are people walking in the door with an ALT that may be a slightly high or an imaging study that showed fat or whatever. So look at it from that perspective. It's more like the NAFL pool and you're whittling. Down. Okay, so then there there are enough patients to get it done. You just have to be very careful and very precise about getting the right patient to the right trial and managed well throughout the process. Yes. I'd agree with what everybody said. And having seen it in the research unit I was working in before, it's very, very difficult. And even when we were doing fiber scans in real time, clinic names quite correct that it's very very difficult to get these patients in we would discharge back to gps nine out of every 10 patient that came in with abnormal liver function test they purely had a fatty soft liver so back to the primary care so i think searching primary care may give us better quality patients coming through already with higher fiber scans and the more appropriate patients coming in but i was reading this week equiva estimate that 940 million undiagnosed patients that this year because of lack of attending face-to-face -face consultations in healthcare in the US. So where are we going to locate and diagnose these patients with the backlog of clinics would be my concern. And, and I suppose the other one is that a lot of people have put on weight. And when we fiber scan, we're probably going to be detecting a significant more patients with high fat, high stiffness because of inflammation, because they've loaded their livers with fat with the COVID effect. And I think they will give us more false positives. But when we get them closer to biopsy, they may actually fail and scream foul because they're giving us the wrong signals because of the COVID effect of, and lifestyle. So those are just the two or three things that I, I've been thinking about when I look at the patients that we see. So here's here's COVID again. That's another complexity in enrolling NASH clinical trials. But from a different twist, I think Louise has really shed light on a part of this COVID pandemic issue that I haven't ever thought about before. Let me just tell you what I mean. So when I, when I do my clinic, half of my well, not quite half, maybe a quarter of my patients won't come in. So it's a telehealth visit. And for a lot of primary care, that's still all they're doing. So think of, I'm just thinking about my own practice. I When I'm on a telehealth visit, everything I do is suddenly compressed and I fall back to my foundational principles of medicine. I, I begin to not think outside the box. I, I'm not willing to entertain alternative hypotheses. I, I'm just focused on what is in front of me and how do I fix what I can fix on that telephone call. And I think our primary care colleagues and our endocrine colleagues and our other GI colleagues and our other liver colleagues are doing the exact same thing. Whereas if we weren't in a COVID pandemic, hear me out here, somebody could come into that clinic and say, look, I've got a new test, a new blood test, a new imaging study. I've got a trial that is kicking butt and taking names for fatty liver, leaving a big fat dent on this planet for fatty liver disease. Let me share that with you. Let me take a couple minutes of your day and show how I can help you in your clinical practice of fatty liver by offering something better than what you're doing today. That opportunity has been abrogated significantly in 2020 because of COVID. So I think that's an angle to this COVID thing I haven't ever thought about until Louise just mentioned it. And I think as we begin to get vaccinated, patients begin to come back in. We open the doors to allow people to come in and teach us about parts of the disease that we see that we don't fully understand or know, or that new science has led us to some new discoveries or potential opportunities in my own hometown exist to send patients to get care that I can't offer them, I think that will open the floodgates. But right now, we're constrained by the COVID rules. You know, Stephen, that's that's fascinating. I um, was talking this morning with a primary care physician here who's a good personal friend. I shared with him what you and Manal were talking about with your siblings and ER medicine a month, month and a half back on podcast and how hard it was. I asked how it affected him. What he said was, I do everything I do, and every day COVID is going to put work on top. Don't know how much. Some days a tremendous amount, some days less. 
I said, so how does that affect morale? He said, well, everybody's adjusted with morale. I said, how does it affect your ability to think? And he said, at this point, the only research that I'm doing is what I'm sent in newsletters by my system because I don't have time. He said, so I feel like I'm being kept up to date to the degree that my health system is sending me information to help me do that. But the inquisitiveness, the things I'm fascinated by, he said, he said none of that. Yeah. So to take that one step further to your to your people that are at the tip of the spear, the hepatologist in this particular conversation conversation with this particular disease. The last time we were able to gather together was January of 2020, now 13 months ago. And so you say, well, there's all these virtual opportunities. Here's what happens in a virtual clinic. It's the same thing that happens if the meeting happens to be in the town that you live in. You're still on call. You still have to round on your service. You still have to see patients. Or if I'm doing Zoom like I am right now, except this is AASLD or it's easel. Doc, I know you're in there on a meeting, but look, I got to run this case by you. You got to see this. This, this is just got, to, we got to deal with it. Uh, the sky is falling. Chicken little, you've got to save the day. Figure this out for me. I can't say, I'm really not here. This is a hologram. I'm in whatever city at a, at a virtual meeting. So even virtual meetings were pulled away from and and distracted from that really that experiential learning that we're so used to having. So it really, I think, adds to what your friend told you, Roger, about about learning new things in this pandemic that we live in outside of new things relative to COVID. So let me go back to Rashmi, because Rashmi, you've made the point that one of the things we need to do is better physician to physician education. Yeah, absolutely. How do we address that challenge now? And as we come out of COVID a little bit and people have new habits that they've developed that aren't frankly good habits for this kind of open-ended learning, how do we start to bring them back to the older, more open-ended structure? Or what do we do instead? Well, I think if you're talking about a physician to physician education opportunity, we've really not been able to meet a lot of our physicians in our community face to face. And I think that's when we have the best conversations is when we look at a specific patient case or we're able to give a 30 minute lecture to the physician and his mid-levels. We've unfortunately been trying to do that in a way that is still personal through Zoom lunch and learns and, and different ways of interacting. Um, but I, I do still think that it's kind of a snippet that we give the physician who right now in the middle of a pandemic already has a huge checklist of things to check off. So fatty liver is, is still in the background. So it's kind of continuing to knock on the door, you know, and continuing to sort of make liver disease a priority on that checklist. I would say the other thing that we are probably going to see and why fiber scan is so important is that those patients who we saw in clinic six months ago who had maybe an intermediate amount of stiffness or uh, kind of in the gray area who have gained now 30, 40 pounds in the past year are now going to have high risk findings. And so those are people who, when we met them the first time, we kind of said, look, you have the potential for advanced liver disease and we're meeting for the first time. So it's kind of shocking for the patient. We give them a little bit of time to think about being on a clinical trial. And when we present them with their second fibro scan finding after they haven't been able to lose the weight or undergo the lifestyle modification that we ask, then I think it's very telling for them to see two findings on their fibro scan that are similar or worsening uh, in terms of the numbers. And I think at that point, when we're more empathetic to them and we're giving them more data that uh, they're more willing to be on a, a clinical study. So that's kind of what's going to happen is we're going to see those patients again in clinic and we're going to have to retell the story for them, but also help them understand that lifestyle modification is part of the picture, but not the full picture. And just to go back to education also for the sponsors, I think this is very important that they include, uh, you know, hepatologist experience sites and um, the early um, discussions of protocol development and inclusion 
inclusion exclusion criteria because it's always uh, you know this tension between trying to enrich your patient population and have this you know highly selected group of patients with significant liver fat and inflammation and fibrosis and no comorbidities and then real life which is really finding these people that qualify so i think uh, you know obviously it's always important to have people in academia but also people that actually enroll the trials because they will help you i mean sometimes the sponsors have criteria that just doesn't really make sense for the drug they're trying to develop and they require you know a specific alt or pdff where you can actually go with a little bit lower values and it will not probably affect anything related to the trial uh, even you know uh, concomitant uh, medications comorbidities things like that i mean if you include all statins versus certain statins as exclusionary that will affect how many patients we can include there are things you can't go around you know like a1c above 9.5 this will always be exclusionary uh, but you know i mean in the early days we had uh, different values uh, sometimes it was nine sometimes it was ten and these you know tiny differences make a big difference for sites that's trying to enroll these patients so i think just listening to the sites if we give them feedback related to a specific inclusion or exclusion criteria if they don't have a good rationale i think you know to be more open-minded and try to be inclusionary uh, rather than exclusionary i mean even bmi if you say you're going to set your bmi at 35 versus 40 versus 45 that makes a huge difference for us and if you have a good rationale and you're worried about the pk of your drug i understand but if it's just something because everyone else is doing it you, you know you better think it through and make sure that you need to have that lower bmi uh so i don't know what you guys think you know harash me steven uh, about other things that can be helpful to the sponsors well let me let me ask both of you this so if you're a sponsor and you're listening to this podcast i know many of you do you want to you want to listen to what dr patil and dr al Khoury tell you because the enemy of good is great you can have the best clinical trial design on the planet and never enroll it so what i've seen happen is trial protocols that are written but not really run by people that are boots on ground seeing these people day in and day out we wind up having 10 protocol amendments because it's death by a thousand cuts. Rashmi and Naeem, what are, give me your top 10 list of things that you would like to see changed on protocols going forward. Naeem, I heard you mention BMI, and I can tell you I see a lot of times protocols where there's an upper limit of, of say, 35, maybe 40. And, and the rationale has always been, well, they can't fit in the MRI scanner or, you know, it's not necessarily a PKPD issue, as you alluded to. Certainly, that would be, if you've got that problem, I would question whether or not this is the, the right field to be studying your drug, right? So, so ultimately, pushing the BMI out, pushing age out, unless it's a phase three trial where you're going to be following them for, for a long, long time, short-term phase 2A proof of concept trials, we can take ages up higher as well. Kidney function, INR, platelet count, all these things. What are, give me, maybe Rashmi will start with you. Give me four or five, six things that just really get under your skin with protocols that you would like to see sponsors maybe spend a little bit more time uh, carefully thinking through whether that should be in the protocol inclusion exclusion criteria. It could be an inclusion or it could be an exclusion criteria. Well, I would agree with the BMI issue. We're involved in, in a protocol now where we had two patients who had high-risk fiber scans, ALT, AST in the 50s, 60s, diabetic, who screen failed because of the BMI. Um, I would say, additionally, we do see several patients who have relatively normal liver enzymes who, when we take them to biopsy, they actually meet the criteria based on NAS and, and have advanced fibrosis. So I think Dr. Harrison Summit has done a, a great job in bringing the AST for women down to 17 for inclusion because before it was 20 and above. And and being more inclusive and understanding that there, there can be patients with normal liver enzymes who have advanced disease. I would say additionally, we have a lot of patients who are, given in the pandemic, people are, are suffering from depression, anxiety, just based on what's going on in the world. And so in some of these protocols, we have mood calculators that are used. And, and sometimes patients don't have to be suicidal to fail that exam. They could just be feeling more depressed than, than they normally are. And 
not to mention in chronic liver disease, patients are, are typically pretty depressed because they're dealing not only with chronic liver disease, but also with typically several other comorbid conditions. Um, so I'd say that is uh, something that we need to be more granular about. Additionally, I think when we we move into cirrhosis trials, I know Naeem, you're also involved in, in several cirrhosis trials, but, but uh, that's a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> That, that we have to sort of understand how to find a compensated cirrhotic patient based on platelet count, based on meeting that patient at an early diagnosis of cirrhosis. But I would say with, with NASH, uh, the other major issue that we see a lot of times is the con meds being changed around by the GPs or the endocrinologists. So we see a lot of diabetes meds being switched around during screening or even when the patient is randomized. So we have to be a little bit more lenient. I mean, I understand with the glip ones you can't really, you know, start a patient on a glip one right when they're starting a clinical study, but there are several other classes of diabetes meds which we should be allowing. It doesn't have to be six months of stability. In in the area where, where we live, uh, we serve a lot of uninsured or underinsured folks who, who just don't have the ability to be seeing an endocrinologist every three months. And so their A1Cs can be out of control. So if the GP needs to control the diabetes, we have to, to be a little bit more lenient in terms of the the timing of when those drugs are started. I think that's a lot. Yeah, that, that's tremendous. I want to hear Naeem's comments as well, but I want to just touch on a couple of things you said. So things I've seen in my own practice that really speak to what you said and resonate with me, this depression issue, we, we do audit C questionnaires, for instance, where we're trying to get a depressive history. And I had a, a lady just this past week who she's 58. When she was 18, she had a thought of hurting herself because of a situation she was in. She's lived an amazing life and has is very happy and has never had another thought in her life about hurting herself, not depressed in the least. But because the protocol read, if any of these are checked, yes, they're excluded. That's what we're talking about, not having wiggle room there. At least, you know, you could say something like, if positive, consult with medical monitor. PI should discuss with medical monitor to come to a consensus decision on whether to move forward. Same thing with things like blood pressure. We've had many people, I got the 160 over 100 being exclusionary, but sometimes people are very nervous. Sometimes they forget to take their medication in the morning. And if we're just allowed to retest that patient at the time, you know, they have to come back in for a second set of LFTs now, usually two to four weeks later, just allowing that blood pressure check to allow us to continue screening and then repeat that patient's blood pressure at their next time they come into clinic. The other one would be sometimes we all get labs that are just, for whatever reason, out of, out of range. Maybe it's a slightly too low AST. Maybe it's a creatinine or a GFR that's just one point one way or the other, or an INR or a platelet count. Allow for a one-time retest. Those are simple things that could be built into a protocol that if you don't have, that patient is suddenly, you know, screen fail. And then the combat issue, I think, is is another critical one. Um, understand, understand fully that sometimes drug-drug interaction studies haven't been fully run to ground with your drug, and those will continue to be ongoing. But don't throw the pharmacopoeia at us and say you're excluded from every one of these drugs until we've studied them in DDI. That's an issue. But uh, uh, Naeem, what do you think? Do you, you have things you'd like to add to that list? I think, uh, you know, you guys discussed so many uh, important issues. Uh, I'll go back to cirrhosis trials. I think, you know, the one thing is uh, the platelet count that we want to find these patients that are, you know, the perfect cirrhotics with the platelet count above 140,000. And I think, you know, that could be sometimes unreasonable and it's really hard to find. So you have to think about every exclusion criteria. And if if you think you can lower the platelet count to 120,000, then you should do it. If you think you can go down to 100,000, that's even better. The more inclusive you are, the better it is for us. Same thing with certain drugs and cirrhosis. If you have any history of esophageal varices, even if it was, you know, on an endoscopy done five years ago, you are excluded. And uh, sometimes, you know, some of these patients, despite having cirrhosis, they stopped drinking alcohol completely. They lost some weight. Maybe they don't have varices now. So uh, again, think about every exclusion 
different criteria. For the regular NASH trials, I think also the same thing applies to the fiber scan criteria you're using and uh, the mechanism of action of your drug. So if you have, you know, an antifibrotic medication and you're not so invested in steatosis, can you lower the cap to 280 instead of 300? Think about your PDFF cut point also, and that applies to cirrhosis and non-cirrhosis. We all know that you lose fat as you progress to cirrhosis. So if you're designing a cirrhosis trial, you need to lower the PDFF cutoff. You know, why have 8% if all you need is 5% to show that there is a little bit of fat in the liver because you're trying to make sure that the uh, etiology underlying cirrhosis is fatty liver disease. Uh, so all of these things, even the, the stability of medications, Rashmi, you mentioned this, um, you know, do you need six months or can you get away with uh, three months? Does it really make difference uh, based on your drug and mechanism of action? Uh, more recently, I'm seeing also uh, the FAST score being used to screen for trials instead of specific uh, fiber scan criteria. So the most common criteria we have in trials is a CAP score above 300 and liver stiffness above 8.5, which I think makes a lot of sense if you're trying to identify patients with steatosis and F2 or higher. But the FAST score has AST in it, and the idea was to make sure that you have enough inflammation. But it is highly driven by AST, and you can end up with patients with liver stiffness of 5.5 and high AST, and they will qualify based on what cut point you use. So I'm, I'm not saying the FAST score is not a good tool. I think it's an amazing tool, but you just need to understand how to use it. And again, ask people who are actually seeing these patients in clinic uh, to select the appropriate cut point. And I, I see a very high value uh, in using it to predict patients that will not qualify. So very good negative predictive value. I'm not too sure about the positive predictive value uh, in a you know a regular GI clinic. So uh, all these you know uh, minor details, I think they end up adding up to helping us finding more patients and decreasing the screen failure rate. That's been great and, and immensely helpful, I think, for uh, our listeners. Stephen, as someone who spends more time talking to sponsors, uh, I have a question for you, which is that I put on my um, client side hat, different departments dealt with in different ways. And what I hear is pressure that they'll get if they do the kinds of things that we're talking about here. They just say, oh, they're just trying to make it easier. And I can see that pressure coming from one or more of three places. And I'm wondering, A, are those real issues? And B, in talking to sponsors, how would you uh, address that if that came up? Uh, number one, we used to joke about how legal was called the Department of Sales Prevention because their job was simply never to get a lawsuit. So anytime that you had to take a risk, they wouldn't take it. And I can see something like that happen here. I've done projects in the past where it turned out that regulatory had misunderstood what the agency was going to want and as a result really got hammered. So it's in their interest to be so conservative. Well, I think we have the beauty of the FDA webinar to fall back on and the white paper to support that that came out in hepatology recently. You know, look, the division has undergone massive change. There's new leadership and we're having to rethink the complexities of a, of a histopathologic surrogate endpoint. So I think the agency has done a yeoman's job, a very good job of trying to clear the air in the past couple of months. And I think they made it clear, as clear as can be, that phase 2B, you need histopathology. Phase 3, you still need histopathology. Phase 2A, early proof of concept trials. In my mind, the only reason I would do histopathology is if I wanted to do something like NGM or Acaro did, where I want to get an early readout on what's happening in the liver because I'm moving the needle rapidly and profoundly and significantly on non-invasive tests. Acaro chose to do that in people that had a very profound drop in liver fat content. And they did biopsies in those that hit that number, 30% relative drop in liver fat, and they were able to use that to get additional capital funding to go do the next phase study because they de-risked that to a certain extent. So what I would say to, to people that, that are looking at designing trials is the risk has been baked in based on what the FDA has told us. If it's an early phase trial, you don't need histopathology. You just need a representative NAFLD population with some degree of having risk for NASH and fibrosis so that you can see 
if your treatment is going to have a positive impact on non-invasive tests. Now, here's where we are with that. If you're a drug that moves liver fat, PDFF is now well described to correlate with change in histopathology if you hit a certain threshold of change. ALT has done that as well. We don't fully yet know what magnitude of effect change in Pro-C3 or ELF correlates with positive impacts on histology, but we know what baselines are for disease severity. So for Pro-C3, for instance, we know above 15, 15 and a half, that's going to correlate with a more advanced NASH population. ELF scores above 9.8 do the same thing. We learned a little bit from Intercept that a 25% reduction in fibro scan over time has a correlatory impact on histopathology as well. So I'd say that to say when you design your trial, the, the people that are interested in whether or not you are successful are the investors for the next round of your trial. And they're going to ask, did you hit this metric that correlates to either an outcome or that correlates to a change in histopathology that we're likely to see if I invest more money in your paired liver biopsy phase two trial. So as long as you're, you're identifying your non-invasive test that's likely to be accentuated by your mechanism of action, that's de-risking your trial. And you don't need liver biopsies in that early phase study, which means you can be more uh, liberal in who you include in those early phase trials. Now, when you get to a, a phase 2B study, it becomes a little bit more restrictive, and certainly it does in phase 3. This has been a fantastic conversation, and we're kind of getting to the bottom of it. So let me do this, Stephen, first, and then we'll go around. The one message that you would like to deliver first to sponsors, then to investors about how to understand the right way to approach this. I just heard you say be strategic, but that's a short phrase, without saying exactly that, but that's a short phrase. One simple thing that a sponsor needs to keep in mind and an investor needs to keep in mind, it can be a big picture, small picture thing. I don't really care. What do you think? Well, you know me, I'm, I'm, I can't ever come up with just one thing. So I'm going to give you a couple quick bullet points. Number one, there are plenty of people out there with significant disease that could be enrolled in clinical trials but it's complicated to find them. And you want to focus on trial sites that have a process in place to identify these patients. In that same token, you want to listen to these PIs, these principal investigators that have been in the battle and that know the complexities of what makes a trial easy to enroll and what it, makes it more challenging to enroll. And as I said before, the enemy of good is great. Don't design the most perfect trial on the planet and expect it to be enrolled quickly. Have realistic expectations in the era of COVID and in the era of having multiple competing trials that if you have a 300 patient paired liver biopsy trial that enrolls F2 and F3 patients only and you're required to get an MRI, that it's going to take you a long time to enroll that trial. Just understand that. You can't enroll that, and that the, the investors of the world need to hear that. You're not going to enroll a large Phase 2B trial in six months or even a year. A Phase 3 trial where you're putting a 1,000 patients in it and you're very, very selective in that patient population will take even longer to enroll. That's just the, where we are today. It doesn't mean it can't be. And we need to work side by side to develop the right criteria to accelerate enrollment. But at the same time, we need to be working with the sponsors on how to identify people, how to build our disease state awareness campaign to get at the patients, to get at the endocrinologist, the primary care docs, our GI colleagues. How do we do that? Well, there's a lot of ways to do that. Reach out to us. We'll help you understand it. But I get back to what Louise said at the very beginning that really just resonates resonated with me is these providers are so focused on the task at hand in the COVID era that they're not they're not opening their minds to thinking about new ideas and new treatment possibilities. And so we have to open that back up for them, particularly as vaccinations come online. So sorry I took so long, but there's so much to cover. And I, I want to say thank you again for Rashmi and Naeem coming on board and helping uh, Louise and myself and, and Roger work through this complicated task. Amen to that. And with that, um, whoever wants to go next with a message that they would like to get to 
the sponsors and evaluate and investors, people who are evaluating all this and, dri and driving the challenges. Stephen, you summed it up very eloquently. I think the key message for me is, you know, talk to investigators that actually run the clinical trials early on. Don't design a protocol knowing you're going to amend it as soon as you start enrolling for the trial. Just check with us early on so we can help you. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the other thing we touched base on is that the histologic endpoints and uh, we didn't even talk about issues related to local reads and central reads and discordance between pathologists. Even at experience sites, we still have about 35% screen failure rate related to pathology. And if you go to inexperienced sites, I mean, that can be as high as 70, 80%. And I think that's just not fair for these patients to undergo liver biopsy and then not qualify for the study because they have uh, less severe disease. So I think, uh, you know, the, the key message is just start the conversation early and talk to the sites and develop a protocol that's realistic that would actually enroll patients that represent NASH patients that we see in clinical practice. I like echo what everybody said. Just to add a little confounder in there, education is key. And Rashmi said it at the very beginning that certain populations feel that they're excluded from trials. They don't engage very well. They do feel like they're guinea pigs. And very much wealth is health. The majority of people who are enrolled into clinical trials come from higher socioeconomic groups. We can access better health care. We can access better education. And it shouldn't always be on the health service providers, the research trial sites, the primary care physicians to educate. We need protocol sponsors to start to educate communities to be available and want to participate in clinical trials that affect them greatly. We need to get rid of the barriers to distrust. And COVID, sadly, again, has distanced the socioeconomic groups. So therefore, a lot of our population who are really eligible for these trials sit in the lower socioeconomic groups with the least access and the least educational opportunities, but with the greatest wealth of people who could benefit from these clinical trials. So for me, to be able to ask sponsors to improve the educational materials to primary care and different populations would be would help enroll those trials a lot quicker and also break down the barriers for people entering clinical studies. I would echo everything that the others on this podcast have already mentioned, but I, I do think what Louise just said is really important, and that is we've got to continue to educate the physicians who are seeing these patients. You know, the majority of these NASH patients with advanced fibrosis are sitting in primary care physician clinics and in endocrinology clinics. And we have to meet the patients where they are, either in these practices or in the community. I think the other thing that is really important that I took away from this is that we have three top enrolling principal investigators on this call today. And at each one of our sites, we would be thrilled if we could enroll 150 patients in a year. And so what that means is that it is extremely difficult to get patients enrolled into these NASH clinical trials and get them through the hurdles of screening. So we're given eight weeks to do labs, stability labs as well, MRI, biopsy, fibro scan, and then you go into cirrhosis trials and we have to add endoscopy and hepatocellular carcinoma screening into those eight weeks. So it's just really important for sponsors and for those designing these trials to meet us where we are realistically boots on the ground, as Dr. Harrison said. That's great. And, and Rashmi, thanks for a fantastic first contribution. Looking forward to having you back many times as, as we move along. I've listened to all this through the ear of the people who've been my clients and, and were my marketing clients and my senior management clients as well. And I think what may happen in some of these cases is that they get a competitive intelligence firm who goes and looks at clinicaltrials.gov and says, this is what so-and-so is doing, you got to do that. Or as I said, regulatory people whose uh, incentives involve never getting a trial thrown back for having been too liberal in your interpretation of who you can include. And people who develop the bias of what a good practice is. And the world is changing, but they're not catching up because they don't have the time. I think Stephen's point about good and great being the enemy, I think that's right. If you have a competitor who's got a trial file that you know about that has a wish list that sounds too perfect for words, it's probably safe to assume they're going to have problems executing it. So rather than trying to chase them down the hole of perfect, decide that the competitive advantage might merely be to do the most realistic trial you can do fastest. Because one of the things we know in virtually every drug class ever is first to market with a successful product has the highest long-term 
return on investment, even if they don't ultimately dominate the class because they've got years in advance of everybody else where they're the only game there. So if the goal is to get the first good product to market and not the first perfect trial submitted to the FDA, uh, I think the advice you folks have been giving today is just fantastically helpful in terms of people understanding the difference between the two and where to look for margins and abilities to get an edge. That would be my closing comment. Again, Rashmi, thank you so much. Naeem also came on last minute. Stephen, Louise, as always, not not a topic this week for you or me to contribute as much on as some other weeks, but I got a ton out of listening. I hope you did as well. I'm sure you did as well. I've been watching you nod as we've been going along. Thanks to Mike Wilson, who keeps making this stuff sound good, and I can hear as we go along where some of those challenges would be. Eric Rounds, Social Media Master, Paul Thea, you, all the listeners. And we will be back next week, maybe with the topic we're going to have today, maybe with one or two other things at some point we're going to start talking about Nashtag, which is coming up in March. So whatever weather you have this week, snow, cold, misery, beautiful, warm weather, good luck with it. Stay safe. Surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. You've been listening to the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to surfingnash.com and we will answer on the podcast or the website. Thanks for listening. See you next week on the podcast.